Since the good old days of the Cold War, when the arms race pitted the US and the West against the Soviet bloc, the stockpiling of nuclear weapons has cast a shadow of mutually assured destruction over the nightmares of billions of people. What if one of the nuclear powers decides to launch first strike? What if one of the other powers retaliates? What if a warhead is launched by mistake? And yet it may be argued that the mere existence of this arsenal is what has prevented the world from plunging into an all-out World War III. This is the concept at the heart of the nuclear deterrence doctrine. By simply having the possibility to retaliate with weapons of mass destruction, one or more powers can preserve peace and prevent aggression. The doctrine has indeed proven to be valid, at least as far as nuclear powers are concerned. That is why the US Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center considers nuclear deterrence as, quote, the number one priority mission of the Department of Defense. The nuclear deterrent underwrites every US military operation on the globe. It is the backstop and foundation of our national defense and that of our allies. Now, the Cold War, at least the original version, belongs to the history books, but nuclear deterrence is still relevant and will continue to be relevant for the foreseeable future. That is why, if you are a nuclear power, it makes sense to take good care of your existing arsenal and its launch facilities. And that's until you reach a certain point when you realize that your old kit just won't do and it's time for the Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile to stand easy and for its replacement, the Sentinels, to stand to attention. American nuclear deterrence is guaranteed by the three legs of the U.S. nuclear triad, which involves nuclear-capable bombers, ballistic missiles launched from submarines, and land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. An ICBM is a type of ballistic missile with a range greater than 3,400 miles, or about 5,500 kilometers. ICBMs can deliver any type of payload, including conventional weapons, but they are mainly associated with nuclear ordnance. They are usually composed of a multi-stage rocket booster running on solid fuel, whose job is to propel the whole missile structure into a suborbital flight. Midway through its trajectory, the ICBM will release a re-entry vehicle, or RV, with the unenviable task of delivering a devastating nuclear warhead toward the intended target. American doctrine for the use of ICBMs dictates for them to be used only in retaliation, once an incoming enemy nuclear missile is detected. According to the U.S. nuclear launch decision process, after a mere 17 minutes from the threat being detected, the president should be able to decide on which, quote, response option should be executed. If the option is a retaliatory strike, the president will inform the Pentagon War Room. The National Military Command Center, or NMCC, will then challenge the president to provide some gold codes for authentication. Within the next two minutes, the NMCC will transmit the launch codes for a retaliatory strike. At 22 to 27 minutes from threat detection, one or more ICMs will be launched, and it will take them approximately 30 minutes to reach any target around the globe. Needless to say, once an ICBM is airborne, it cannot be recalled or voluntarily destroyed. Since the 1970s, the Air Force's land-based ICBM of choice has been the LGM 30G Miniman III. Bestowing the name Miniman upon such a blatantly phallic contraption may elicit some chuckles, but the origin of the name could not be more patriotic. During the American Revolutionary War, the Minutemen were in fact an elite force of highly mobile infantry. And the LGM acronym, by the way, is a designator indicating that the weapons will be L, launched from a silo, that they will attack targets on the ground, and that they are, well, M. For missiles. As of 2024, 400 Minuteman III ICBMs are still in service, located across three Air Force bases F.E. Warren in Wyoming, Nostrum in Montana, and Minot in North Dakota. This array of weaponry is overseen by the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center's ICBM Systems Directorate. Since 1970, much of their work has consisted of maintaining, repairing, and upgrading several components and subsystems of the Miniman. But there is only so much you can do to keep an old machine running, and sooner or later, you've got to replace it with a new model. This became evident in 2006, when the Air Force voiced concerns about the reliability of the Miniman and the launch infrastructure. In October of that year, US Congress passed the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2007, which instructed the Secretary of the Air Force to modernize the Miniman III. The project idled for a couple of years, during which the military even considered getting rid of land-based ICBMs altogether. Their trajectory was considered too predictable, and launch silos could be vulnerable to preemptive strikes. These flaws made them the weak link in the nuclear triad, as compared to submarine-launched missiles and stealth strategic bombers. But 
A nuclear posture review conducted in 2010 reaffirmed the need to maintain all three legs of the triad to maintain a strategic advantage. This review re-energized modernization efforts, and finding a suitable replacement for the Minutemen became a top priority for the Department of Defense. The Air Force initiated an exhaustive analysis of alternatives, with a renovation program of existing ICBMs and their launch infrastructure still being an option. But in 2014, the U.S. Air Force cast its die. The LGM-30 Minutemen III missiles they were going to go away. They would be replaced by a new missile system to remain in service until 2075. Logically, also, the launch silos and supporting infrastructure would require a massive makeover as well. The program was initially named Ground-Based Strategic Deterrence, or GBSD. It was initiated in 2016 when the Nuclear Weapons Center issued a request for proposal to leading military suppliers. The request was answered by bids from Boeing and Northrop Grumman, both of whom signed a preliminary design and technology maturation agreement in 2017. By 2019, Boeing had dropped from the race, and in September 2020, Northrop Grumman was awarded an engineering and manufacturing development contract. The focus of the contract was for Northrop and its partners to develop the new ICBMs, which in April 2022 received their official name, the LGM-35A Sentinel. According to initial plans, the Air Force will procure 659 Sentinels, of which 400 will be operational, 234 will be kept in reserve, and 25 will be dedicated to testing purposes only. The first nine Sentinels are expected for delivery in 2029, but will become fully operational only in 2030, when they will start gradually replacing the minimum. The entire batch should be completed by 2036, when the LGM-30 Miniman III missiles will be definitively retired. The new missiles will be deployed at the pre-existing launch fields in Wyoming, Montana, and North Dakota, but they'll also be supported by maintenance, training, storage, and testing facilities such as the Hill Air Force Base in Utah, Camp Guernsey in Wyoming, and Camp Navajo in Arizona. The key concept here is replacement. As Sentinel missiles are completed and deployed, existing Minutemen will be gradually retired. The intention of the Air Force, in fact, is not to increase the number of ICBMs on American soil. Quote, the total number of land-based nuclear missiles on alert 24-7, 365 in the continental United States will remain the same. From January 2022 to January 2023, Northrop Grumman conducted extensive wind tunnel tests on scale models of the LGM-35A. These experiments were grouped under seven test campaigns, each of them designed to assess the response of the missile to atmospheric load and speed variables. The wind tunnel test simulated all phases of the missile's operations, from launch to stage separation to flight at hypersonic speeds. According to a February 2023 Northrop press release, quote, the physical test campaign validated the program's digital modeling and simulations and proved the design maturity of the missile. The campaign on scale models was followed by the first full-scale test of the Stage 1 rocket motor successfully conducted on March the 2nd, 2023. Almost one year later, on February the 20th, 2024, the company released another update, which again sounded very promising. Further tests have been conducted, quote, marking significant progress for the program in its engineering, manufacturing, and development phase. More specifically, Northrop engineers had stress tested the forward and aft sections of their ICBM, as well as its shroud. And to clarify here, a shroud is an ICBM protective layer consisting of a steel casing filled with a coolant such as liquid oxygen or nitrogen. The purpose of this cooling shroud is to mask the heat signature of a missile, thus hindering detection via infrared sensors. Besides what has been shared about the ongoing tests, neither the US Air Force nor their suppliers have revealed details about the size, weight, expected speed, or the range of these new missiles. What we do know at this stage is that the LGM-35As will be silo-based, just like the Miniman, and they will consist of a three-stage booster rocket. The first two booster stages will be developed by Northrop Grumman, the third one by Aerojet Rocketdyne. The rocket will be topped by a re-entry vehicle, or RV. As a reminder, this is the projectile which detaches from the booster rocket and actually delivers the nuclear warhead to the target. The Miniman fielded a Mark 21 re-entry vehicle, produced by Avco Systems. But in March 2023, the Air Force set aside $15.5 million in funding to initiate research on a next-generation re-entry vehicle, or NGRV. The subsequent research and development contract was awarded to Lockheed Martin, who are expected to deliver their Mark 21A in 2030. Traditionally, the booster Booster segments for ICBMs are built in steel, but in the case of the LGM 35As, they will be made of yet unspecified a lighter composite material. These new materials are expected to maintain or even improve the payload weight capacity of the rockets. In other words, the new Sentinel missiles will be able to carry more equipment than their warhead. 
What this equipment will look like is not defined yet, but it will likely include electronic countermeasures to deflect enemy cyber attacks intended to interfere with the missile's trajectory. The new ICBM will be built according to a modular design, which will allow for simple insertion of new hardware and software. Another benefit of the open architecture is that the government will retain intellectual property of the system. This will allow the Air Force to procure maintenance and future development tasks to other vendors besides the three original suppliers, thus ensuring competitive prices and state of the art servicing. Because let's face it, it's never cheap to have your car serviced by the dealership. And the Air Force will certainly need to spare a few dollars down the line, as the price tag of the entire Sentinel program is, as you might imagine, not exactly cheap. According to the Department of Defense Select Acquisition Report, published in April 2023, the total budget was estimated at $77.7 billion. The acquisition report does not specify if the budget included the development of a new generation of nuclear warheads for the Sentinel program, which may be calculated separately. This would make sense at this stage, as the Air Force initially intends to fit the LGM 35As with the same warheads that are currently mounted on the minimum. That would be the W87 Zero. This warhead was first designed by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in February 1982, and production started in April 1986. Each W87 weighs 800 pounds or 363 kilos and has a yield of 300 kilotons. This equates to 600 million pounds of dynamite or 272 million kilos. For context, the bomb which destroyed Hiroshima had a yield of only 15 kilotons. The W87 Zero yield may be increased to 475 kilotons by adding extra rings of enriched uranium, but even the standard specifications can cause some pretty horrifying damage. Upon exploding, the warhead will release 300 trillion calories of energy, superheating the surrounding air and producing an exploding fireball at least one mile or 1.6 kilometers in diameter. At its center, this fireball will produce temperatures up to five times higher than those found at the sun's core. Core. As a result, the fireball will generate a massive blast wave accompanied by winds traveling at 750 miles per hour or 1,200 kilometers per hour. The destruction caused by the initial blast wave will be followed by more gusts of strong winds traveling in the opposite direction, drawn by the suction effect towards the detonation point. Few structures will be able to withstand the combined effect of the fireball and the subsequent winds. The debris left in the wake of the blast wave will fuel a massive fire extending as far as 4.5 miles or 7.2 kilometers from ground zero. An even larger area, extending to hundreds of square miles, will be impacted by the deadly effects of radioactive to fall out, exposing humans, animals, and vegetation to radiation poisoning. If detonated over a city with the population density of New York, the W87-0 could cause between half a million and 800,000 fatalities, plus up to two million wounded, many of whom would almost certainly die due to the destruction of medical facilities and the death of medical personnel. A true doomsday scenario, which may be equaled or even surpassed by the new warhead being developed by the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration or NNSA, and that would be the W87-1. Also designed by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the new warhead may be deployed as early as 2031 and fitted onto the Sentinel ICBMs. The NNSA, however, may not be able to meet this deadline. The problem is with plutonium pits, the hollow spheres which make up the radioactive core of the W87 warheads. Plutonium pits deteriorate over time and need to eventually be replaced, but the US has not manufactured them since 1989. So, to ensure enough support Supply for the new warheads, the NNSA has initiated the construction of a new uranium processing facility. So, this plant should be able to deliver 80 new plutonium pits per year by 2030. But according to Congressman Seth Moulton of the House Armed Services Committee, the NNSA facility is up to two years behind schedule and may be able to meet production requirements only by the late to mid 2030s. <laughs> All right, so even if the W87-1s are delayed, the Sentinels will still be fitted with the W87-0s. The problem is, the ICBMs themselves are experiencing some pretty serious delivery issues. In January 2024, the Air Force informed Congress that the Sentinel program was expected to exceed its initial budget forecast by at least 37%, because... Of course. The projected increase in cost was not related to the construction of the new ICBMs, though, but rather to upgrade work conducted on the supporting infrastructure, namely launch control facilities and a new underground cable communications network. Then, in June 2024, the Government Accountability Office issued a report warning of potential risks to cost and schedule. 
These risks stemmed from, quote, immature technologies, cybersecurity, staffing, and supply chain challenges. This projected cost increase qualifies as a critical breach, according to the Nunn McCurdy Act. According to this piece of legislation, once a program's costs exceed the breach, the Secretary of Defense must certify that said program is essential to national security, doesn't have cheaper alternatives, and therefore cannot be shut down. The act also requires for the Department of Defense to provide a new set of cost estimates and project milestones to be reviewed by Congress. The DoD's reaction was lightning fast, and by July the 8th, 2024, they were able to announce that the Nunn-McCurdy review was completed. According to Congress, the Sentinel program met the statutory criteria to continue. Defense officials, however, had to concede the Sentinel would undergo significant schedule delays. For example, the first flight tests for the booster rocket had been initially slated for 2023, but now probably won't happen before 2026 due to, quote, increased lead times for guidance computer components. Now, back in January, the Air Force had attributed increased costs and delays to issues related to the infrastructure side of the Sentinel program, not to problems concerning the LGM-35A missiles. But in July, Andrew Hunter, Assistant Air Force Secretary for Acquisition, informed the press that his department was not exactly happy with Northrop Grumman's work on the ICBM. Mr. Hunter even considered searching for new contractors to complete certain parts of the project. So, it appeared that the Sentinel was suffering from widespread issues across the entire program. This was confirmed by Hunter himself in September 2024, as reported by the publication Defense One. By then, the program's cost had massively overrun, with a predicted final price tag of $141 billion, which is 81% beyond initial estimates. Andrew Hunter attributed the ballooning costs to flawed acquisition strategy, which focused on soliciting bids from Northrop Grumman and Boeing as main competitors. This approach naturally placed the spotlight on the development of the rocket booster while neglecting the other aspects of the program. In his words, the request for proposal Really, an acquisition strategy essentially laid out this approach, structured this approach to the program that was kind of missile first and missile focused in terms of the competitive dynamics between the two providers. Obviously, we have to take responsibility as the Air Force because it's an Air Force program, but having said that, we weren't the ones who made a mistake and made the same mistake. And so it was definitely something that happened as a collective we. End quote. According to Hunter, that collective we includes the Air Force, of course, Northrop Grumman, the Department of Defense, and the Pentagon acquisition community. Now, at the time of writing this episode, the future of the ground-based strategic deterrent program and of the LGM-35A Sentinel missile is uncertain. Will the Air Force issue a new request for proposal seeking for additional vendors? Will the entire program be scaled down or maybe even terminated? Well, another fact to consider is the change in leadership at the very top. The November 2024 elections resulted in a second non-consecutive term for President-elect Donald Trump. According to analysts such as Caitlin Dalmage, senior fellow at the Strobe Talbot Center for Security Strategy and Technology, Donald Trump has demonstrated to be in favor of nuclear proliferation. But he also appeared, quote, openly skeptical of the alliance relationships that depend on U.S. nuclear guarantees. Over his second term, the new president might, quote, seek to reduce or eliminate these commitments. These allied countries would have good reason to fear the reliability of the U.S. nuclear umbrella. So, a potential scenario is for Washington to withdraw their nuclear protection to allies in Europe and Asia. If that were to be the case, the new administration may reconsider the GBSD and Sentinel programs, especially in light of their ballooning budgets and extended timelines. Livio Horowitz and Elizabeth Schur at the German Institute for International Politics and Security have a different point of view. They argue that, quote, despite Trump's economic protectionism and aggressive rhetoric, his administration did, in fact, strengthen both conventional and nuclear assurances. The former president repeatedly threatened to withdraw from NATO or withhold defense assistance to allies under attack, but recent reports suggest that he employed this tactic mainly to try and pressure allies into making compromises, end quote. They also point out that in his previous term in 2018, Donald Trump had initiated a nuclear posture review, which concluded with the decision to maintain all legs of the nuclear triangle and to continue investing in the modernization of both armament and its supporting infrastructure. So, only time will tell if and when the Sentinels will replace the Minutemen 3s. If the program does progress, then we can only hope that those $141 billion are put to the best possible use. That hundreds of lethal missiles are constructed, placed in silos carefully maintained for four decades, and never switched on. It may sound like a waste of money in any other context, but when it comes to nuclear deterrence, pouring billions into something you know you will never use is the best possible return on investment. Thank you for watching.